I'd like to thank Catherine, Joe, and Lindsay for arranging this conference, but also for all the work that they've been doing in Ocumel UK. When I started my cancer journey in 2006, it seemed that information was not to be shared with patients. I was specifically told not to look things up on the internet. So the fact that we're here today together discussing things is really wonderful. I practiced medicine for 20 years, so my point of view is sort of from both sides of the doctor's desk, and I'll try and give insight into the driving forces that led me to pursue treatment. I was trying to skip through my medical history. It started for me in December 2006, diagnosis of a small posterior choroidal melanoma in uh, Sheffield, and I was transferred through to Liverpool for treatment where I received proton beam therapy. In November 2008, I developed macular edema, and I had the first of about a dozen intraocular injections of Avastin. May 2009, a private MRI contrast and diffusion weighting scan showed a three to four millimeter lesion in my liver that was not present previously. Rescanning showed it had grown to um, eight to nine millimeters and a possible other lesion nearby. I went to liver resection in September 2009, and then I actually went to June 2010 when I had endophthalmitis, which was treated with a vitrectomy. Endophthalmitis is an infection of the eyeball and it can be a complication of an intraocular infection, as it, injection, as it was in my case. Vitrectomy is where they suck the jelly out of the eyeball. It's not very nice, really. July 2010, I'm afraid an MRI scan again showed another four millimeter lesion and I actually went to a second liver resection. I should add, neither of my liver resections were RO. Um, both cases, I had microscopic lesions within one millimeter. In September 2010, I had ipilimumab infusions and I had various um, side effects. I was on steroids before the end of September, um, and unfortunately in December, the MRI showed another four millimeter lesion, and I completed the course of ipilimumab at the end of December. In January, I had my first zolidronate infusion, which I got because I was on steroids so that I needed to be protected against osteoporosis, which may be a good thing for me. Uh, in February 2011, my MRI, I'm afraid, showed at least 18 sub one centimeter lesions scattered throughout my liver, so I was inoperable. And it was at that stage that I went to Southampton and I received Sir Spheres, selective internal radiation to the liver in the hope of giving me a little bit more time. Um, May, my scans showed stable disease since February and nothing outside the liver, which I was obviously very, very pleased about. June, I went on and had a cataract extraction. Uh, that was probably due to a complication of having had vitrectomy and maybe proton beam therapy, who knows. July 2011, again, stable scans, although this time it did show some radiation damage to the liver, um, with it being swollen. August 2011, I had my second zolondronate infusion. That's the Yorkshire Moors. <laughs> I've been amazingly lucky to be standing here today. In the two and a half years that I have been stage four, I have known many people have their diagnosis of their primary and lose their battle with ocular melanoma. All have seemed more deserving to me. Parents with young children, exceptional athlete, people approaching their retirement having worked all their lives. How many others have there been with a small choroidal melanoma, so low risk, so they weren't scanned, and they found out about their metastasis when they were symptomatic, so they were, may have had at the best months of life, but probably few weeks of life left. Why should I have survived so long with such good quality of life? The questions I continually ask myself. The simple answer is I am a freak. But that's why I persuaded Christine to come, so that I wasn't the only one in the room. <laughs> I feel that there are two main reasons why my outcome is different. The first, I have been very proactive in my disease management. 
many of the therapies I've actually steered my treating physicians towards. And this actually was against all my philosophies as a doctor. Previously, I'd always followed my doctor's advice 100% because patients who follow their doctor's advice do better. This time I behaved differently. It was 48 hours until I broke the no internet rule. I didn't actually like some of the stuff I found there. It upset me. But I also found support there from the Lance Armstrong Foundation initially, because I wasn't really into the internet at all. And that was a safe environment. And then I, on Ocumel list, I met Christine and it just grew from there. At the time of my diagnosis in Liverpool, I was advised that my risk of getting metast metastatic disease in the first five years was 20 to 25%. I'm afraid I double checked it and put myself into other published studies and I came out with a higher risk of 33 to 36%. I felt I needed a plan so that I knew that if I did develop metastatic disease, I had done everything I possibly could to put myself in the best possible position. Then I didn't have to blame myself. I very clearly remembering asking the question, is there really no treatment for metastatic disease? The answer I got was the only treatment of proven benefit is liver resection. And that was when my research started in earnest. I swiftly learned the figures that I looked at was 15% of patients have resectable disease. I didn't want to miss that chance. If I was one of the chosen few to be that lucky, to be given that chance by fate and not bend down and pick it up, to me that seemed unforgivable. I soon realised if it was my destiny to be in that 15%, that annual ultrasound and liver function blood test simply would not be adequate enough and most likely I would present too late for surgical treatment. There followed a very bleak period. It was over a year while I was trying to get private MRI screening and contrast examinations. I finally got resolution through very tenuous contacts through my husband's consultants, anaesthetic colleagues, spouses, <laughs> and by paying. <laughs> Once screening was arranged, I found life much better. People always say screening causes anxiety, but no, I could leave it to the screening. The second reason I feel my outcome has been different, and as far as I can see, this isn't evidence-based, so it's probably quite controversial, but I happen to believe that metastatic disease, it does invade locally, but I believe that it does metastasize. And I also believe that it promotes tumour growth. So in situations where some might advise careful watching, I've pushed for treatment, be it the liver resection, epilimenab or cirsvirs. Full credit goes to the doctors who've been able to tolerate me. <laughs> they are exceptional. I'm not an easy patient to treat. I am demanding and full of questions. And I'm often full of theories that are sometimes without any foundation. And if there's a rare complication, you, you can bet that I'm going to get it. So I'm definitely not a patient that you would like to cross your threshold. In the same manner that I couldn't conform to the expected patient role, my way won't suit every patient. But I do feel that the patient should be allowed to choose their own way because it is their life. Then also the internet is here to stay. I am probably the last age group that was going to be less familiar with IT. So clinicians have to learn to cope with patients that have Googled. Patients and their relatives must also realize that the way I have been treated would push many clinicians outside of their comfort zones. Treatments are not without their consequences. There are no guarantees. Probably proton beam and liver resection are the only two treatments I've had that have any long history of use in ocular melanoma. It's now approaching two and a half years since my metastatic disease appeared. 
I remain completely physically fit and unrestricted, but the treatments have damaged me. Proton beam and intraocular injections have left me with slightly decreased vision. 6-8 at the opticians instead of 6-6, which in my mind is absolutely excellent. And it's much better than the loss of central vision I would have expected if I'd had a plaque radiation on my macula. Ipilimumab has caused problems in the bowel and autoimmune hepatitis. I remain on steroids. And the long-term side effects of ipilimumab, well, who knows, but I would really like to find them out. Surspheres in March, well, it is arduous lying flat there and being obedient for hours. And my gallbladder was a problem and I have experienced some pain on and off there since then. The immediate post spheres time, I was fatigued. And whether that was radiation or stress, no one will know. But by May, I was back to running at a slower pace, but I was doing the things I wanted to do. Mid-June, I was off it again, and then in July, the scans showed the somewhat expected radiation damage to my liver. Now I feel completely well. My liver doesn't actually function completely perfectly. Nobody really knows whether that's a result of the autoimmune hepatitis, the radiation, or of course it could be disease progression. But I will have further scans and I will just have to accept whatever it is and make the most of it because that's the way to cope. Hopefully from today's meeting, patients will no longer feel the isolation and exclusion from healthcare that I experienced back in 2007. We've listened to the clinicians from different specialities of supporting ocular melanoma patients. At last, ways of delivering liver-directed therapy and immune therapies to ocular melanoma are being considered. Christine has shown us that you can actually live with stage 4 ocular melanoma. Sadly, I've never seen that a non-medic could have obtained the care that I have had, and that gives me big feelings of guilt. So the idea of a pathway of care for ocular melanoma patients being developed is, is to me really truly exciting. And finally, I'd like to thank all of the clinicians that I've seen and especially those that have treated me because without them, I wouldn't be here. So thank you very much. Thank you. 
addition more a question. Uh, unanswered skin skin on a throat cancer patient, other ocular patient. I think to, to remark on the strength of the last two voices of hearing patient voice in this. And it is about treatment, it is about all of that advice, but it's also about those patients standing up and speaking, which is highly powerful. And I just urge you to just keep on doing that and be it the old party group and raise your voice there because that's where we have the profound influence in the NCRI and other organisations. If I can help in some of them, please do that. Thank you. When you and Christine uh, both have been an inspiration to us all these days, and it's tremendous. I probably actually keep the weight down because it's my daughter, she has uh, she's, she's got on her own way. I mean, I do two concussions. <laughs> I like to speak to him. I run. <laughs> I run 40 miles a week. <laughs> um, I, I, I have, it's been a big problem because I feel that my face and my body isn't the same as it was when I was zero. And I actually, over the summer, I have been weighing my food just like my hero one up one. <laughs> because I, it's not what I want. It's not And there's two points to that because you, you know you have to think about it, do I want to know what the future holds or don't I want to know to live. But if you do want to know what the future holds and we're asking people to take that decision, then you need to support them in that decision and let us say I've got a high risk disease. We need to screen them, don't we? Because what's the point of knowing these things if you don't do anything about them? Yeah, I mean I think that's what the stuff is. So do you get your screening? Do you get your MRI scans now, or do you have to pay for them? Oh, no, 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 I'm an NHS patient as yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's the funny thing about the NHS. I mean, I, from working in it, was aware of that. Once you sort of land your studies, you know, once you're the liver surgeon's death, you're welcome back into the heart mm. of the NHS again. I mean, at that time, I was I was quite worried because at that time when we were talking about whether you have top up payments and whether patients mm. should or shouldn't be able to and blah blah blah, and so I actually was really sneaky because I had a private GP and I didn't give consent for him to inform the NHS. But not people wouldn't know that, would they? No, no. So, so that's well, it's not fair, then, is it? I mean, we need to offer people. Well, that's the purpose of having yeah. a company because that's the whole thing is that I often felt guilty because I don't know. But you need to, you've got to have people around because that's how you lead the way forward. Yeah. Definitely. So, go to the lady's question. Um, if you do sort of slice some more out of the road of users who suffer in um, well, from remission to cancer now, if we get it up again to go into an MRI and the radiologist is wanting to do the MRI without contrast, whereas we're reading through the literature, we should be having contrast. How much of a right do we have to challenge that decision? None, because I burst into tears. No. Um, the two little radiographers were very upset and said, well, what have you been reading that upset you? I said, it's not a college journal, it's radiology. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> and, and I went in and I had the scan and I came home and I went off looking for a, a private consultant that would do what I wanted. But I mean, it's very difficult. It's much easier for me to equate, is this a good idea, is this a good man? And I've got a husband who's medical and say, calm down, calm down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but for someone without medical knowledge, you have to put your faith somewhere and be without any faith in anyone at all, which is very hard. Okay. It's just speaking on a few things, really. It's, um, I think, finding evidence is so, so difficult, but as, as long as there's no evidence, you're constantly going to come up with this brick wall of asking for tests, investigations and treatments where 
there's a lack of proof. I guess where the NHS and, and where doctors are built not to do harm. Yeah. It, it, and in a sense, I, I feel uncomfortable that the health services and doctors are almost being blamed for not doing it. <coughs> the onus is on us all trying to come up with what is an agreed, sensible standard whilst balancing all these pressures we're all up against. Because treating patients and, and following patients up for 10 years with MRI, which may not be of use, isn't actually helping all the other patients. So we've got to help individuals. We, you know, we've got to put it in context as well. And as long as there's a lack of evidence, this will never go away. You'll, all, you'll always be left to fight in the corner on your own because of that lack of evidence, which is terribly difficult. Can I just ask that? Um, we have, I came in a bit late. I'm Paul Nathan. I'm another medical oncologist. So, so in, I entirely agree with Ernie that, that in the absence of evidence, it's quite easy to become quite fixed on some anecdotal description of what is best practice. And, the, and in the absence of knowing whether that's accurate or not, you, you have an opinion, but you don't know for sure. So just to pick up your example, we know that the proportion of patients who have gadolinium contrast injections and MRI have scarring of the kidneys and can have long-term renal damage and, and, and renal failure. So, yeah. so, so there's an issue there. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so, 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 really so, it's, it's an issue, and so you have to have a certain <coughs> renal function. You have to have a certain renal function, otherwise, you know, uh, otherwise your chance of having uh, uh, a nephrosclerosis is high. Technology is changing all the time. So, for instance, there are techniques with MRI. We heard somebody mention diffusion rate of MRI. Yeah, I like diffusion rate of So, so, and so techniques are changing all the time. And it's possible that diffusion rate of MRI for some patients can provide uh, as much information or different information than a contrast injection. We don't know. We don't. We don't know yet. Oh, and different quantifying so, relative risk. The, what, what the, the relative then? risk of a gadolinium enhanced MR is almost infinitesimally tiny. Mm. I mean, no, 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 I'm not talking about the, I'm, I'm, what, I'm, I'm, what I was using as an example of. Really? I'm an advocate for screening, yeah. and, and you'll hear that in a minute when we have a forum. Yeah. But, but the point I'm trying to make is it's really easy to become fixed on something when you've got no evidence. You're taking a view. And you take a view because it's written in one publication, you haven't looked for other publications, there's a contrary view somewhere, but you end up being polarised and you take a view. And, every, and, and I'm just wary about pushing very hard for, for things for which there is no evidence, when if we work together we can collect I guess from evidence the point of that, 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 that can really uh, in, what we improve. Know is there, there are a few people that talk about the moment that I went to the forum and mm. carried this on. Yeah. Can I just say a sort of radiologist? I think it is, it seems we keep on coming back to this theme. I mean, I think my advice would be very much, you want to find, if you're going to get image, you want to be image in the sense that there's a lot of liver imaging, and you want to find someone you trust in that centre, and you want to let them worry about how they do image you, mm. and not get too involved in, you know, trying to micromanage that, because different centres have different bits of kit. You know, we've all got different types of scanners, different breadth scans. Uh, and we all use them in slightly different ways. And people who work in those centres spend their whole life trying to get the best out of that bit of kit. The difference between someone with a tumour from a, an eye tumour and lots of other tumours we deal with are, 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 are almost irrelevant in terms of detecting those lumps. We're trying to detect lumps in the liver as small as possible. So we spend our lives trying to tailor the scan to get the most information out as possible. So I think the advice I would give is to make sure you get images in the centre with a lot of liver imaging specialist centre, normally that's allied to a liver surgical centre, that's where they do most of the imaging, and then have faith in those individuals and professionals to make sure they, you know, and discuss with them how they're going to you know, perform those tests and how and why they're doing it, you know, they'd be very happy with that. But I wouldn't try and be too didactic, so different bits of machine with the different bits of apparatus have different parameters and therefore we use them differently. And I think if you went in with a very fixed view, you might feel disappointed or you might feel you're being uh, brushed aside, which you wouldn't necessarily be.